I think we're all set. So, hello. And stuff. Hello. Um, there's quite a bunch to talk about, actually. But first of all, I wanted to uh, settle, or at least try to get us to settle on a name for it. Even if it's just temporarily. Since we didn't really finish that talk you last time. I don't even remember most of the uh, suggestions we uh, came up with. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember either, and I still don't know what to actually call it. Right. I think uh, one that we had was like Frozen Mist or something like that. Um, but yeah, they all have kind of uh, more or fewer issues uh, in some aspects. <coughs> Mostly, I guess I'm just trying to get an idea of what kind of uh, visual appeal uh, we would try to get and then sort of incorporate that into a name, maybe? I don't know. Mm, well, I haven't thought of the visuals like at all. I just mean mostly thinking about how to actually make it work. Okay. Uh, I still would like to do something like I'm very much focused on uh, mood and stuff like that like just uh, pretty much in everything I do drawings and writing and everything is very heavily focused on uh, evoking a certain kind of mood so I would really like it if we can get that kind of thing across in our uh, game as well so Something that fits that kind of mood would be nice. But uh, it's certainly not, like... I mean, if we think about whether a game idea even is, to begin with, just sort of a farming life simulator mashup kind of thing, then you wouldn't really think of mood as being the most important primary thing. And most of the time, like, the games don't really focus on that at all. Like, if you take a look at Rune Factory or Harvest Moon, most of the time you just have one preset mood that sticks around the game, and it's mostly cheery and stuff. But it's yeah. not a central element of it at all, so... I would like to uh, see if we can sort of change that and make it not only interesting from uh, gameplay aspects, or, uh, but also from a sort of make it more immersive, I guess. That really feels more like a world to inhabit rather than a world to play in, which I mostly get the feeling of when I play Harvest Moon and Ruin Factory. Well, that would need some very nice simulation for other things than the player. What do you mean? Well, if the world has to be alive, then it has to be alive, not static, and mm. do things on its own. Well, yeah, but I mean more, I mean mood more in the sense of having a sort of uh, visual style that takes you into the game. Like if you think of games that have, have very strong, uh, this very strong kind of setting and feeling to them, to the world, or games like uh, Mist or uh, a lot of horror games actually also do it really well, where you are drawn into the world and it feels like you are sort of, I don't know. It feels more like a world that you could see with your own eyes rather than a world you just play a character in. So that's the kind of thing that I think would be nice to aim for. If you get yeah. what I mean. <laughs> um, not quite, but <laughs> uh, I'm still so happy to figure it out over time. It's hard to describe. Um, let me see if I can find some examples. Uh. <sighs> like, uh, I guess the easiest way to explain it is that uh, all these sort of games that try to do what we are trying to do also have a very cartoony sort of style to them. 
I've never seen anything that tries to be different. So, like, Stardew Valley is pixel-based, but it's still cartoony in how it looks. And same for, very much the same for uh, Ruin Factory and Harvest Moon. And I'm not even sure if there's more than that, but, uh, yeah, that, like, going in this sort of cartoony way also gets you into this uh, setting where it's only really, the only thing you can really evoke is cheeriness, so you have a lofty kind of, you're supposed to feel carefree and just do your thing and walk around and happy and stuff and whatever. And they really don't do something that's heavier in atmosphere very well, or they usually don't do it at all, so they don't even attempt it because it's not going to work very well. Whereas things like, uh, if you, hold on, uh, Uh, what can I find a good example? Uh, hmm. I wish I could fucking just show it to you over stream or something, but I'll have to do with uh, links, I guess. Mostly just looking at screenshots of uh, Mist 4. Something like this. Like, if you look at this, it immediately gives a certain kind of, how should I say, it feels thicker, in a sense. Yeah, the atmosphere. Right. So, I would really, that would be absolutely fantastic for me if we could have a sort of, what I'm trying to imagine right now is a sort of a, a day-night cycle, where especially in mornings and uh, evenings, you get this sort of, uh, thick kind of oppressive almost atmosphere uh, where for example we could say that the fog starts to or the mist starts to cover the areas and then it starts to feel sort of uh, almost dreamlike and during the nights and the day you have the clear faces where it's again more cartoony and normal but you have these interspersed uh, times where things feel more mysterious, I guess. And we could link that up to, to sort of special events, like we could have certain creatures or something like that that only wake up during these times where the fog covers stuff, or we could have plants that need certain conditions to grow, and so we could build that into the uh, game mechanics, but still get this kind of... Uh, uh, sort of more unique and changing atmosphere out of it. Does that make more sense? <laughs> yeah, I think I understood what you mean. Okay. I'm still not, I'm not, I can't say I know how to pull this off given what we were going for right uh, so far, like with the uh, 2D sprites. But I think it should be doable since we're not we're not going for this extremely cartoony style like Paper Mario and we're not going for a pixel based style or something like that that would be m more unflexible I guess so I think it should be doable if we can get the lighting and uh, the uh, shading to work correctly that we can build much stronger moods into uh, the visuals than uh, other games like this have <coughs> Still having a slight cold, so excuse my coughing and my clocked up nose and stuff. But yeah, given that, I would really like it if we have a name that sort of hints at that, since that would be a uh, distinguishing feature of it all. Yeah. Um... Now I all can think of is missed, and that's been it done. Yeah. Though I don't really. I mean, I don't think any farming games have missed in their titles, so we should be fine on that front. Um, yeah, the best I can uh, can come up with still is just Frozen Mist, but it, I'm not sure if that's quite right. It feels a bit too cold. Not cold in the sense of uh, freezing, but cold in the sense of 
uh, maybe too distant for what the majority of the game is about. Though I guess that could be a valid kind of contrast. So I don't know. It's a tough decision to make. Oh. What are you sighing about? <laughs> I'm just trying to think. It's really hard to come up with names. That's certainly true. I mean, just... Just keep on thinking aloud. That would probably keep things fresher. Or at least I can suggest things. Like, uh, different kinds of words for mist would be fog or dew. So... But fog is kind of, I don't know, it doesn't flow very well. It doesn't give this kind of, uh, I don't know, it doesn't have this kind of mysterious ring to it that mist does, I guess. But I'm more thinking about the aspect of frozen, if we can somehow find a work to replace that. that like, the frozen part is only supposed to sort of contrast it and make it interesting because the two words aren't no, uh, usually associated with each other so something that stands in opposition or contrast to mist I guess would be nice well arctic I guess mm -hmm. so you get a lot of fog and mist up there as well uh, hmm. but that would imply we're like on the mountain tops and stuff I'm not sure about that <laughs> Usually that kind of climate isn't really, uh, lends itself well to farming. But let me hit up the thesaurus and see what I cannot come up with. <clears throat> I'm guessing, how should I put this? I'm thinking of, uh, I'm trying to think of words in English that, uh, sort of are the same as the German Starr which means sort of stiff, I guess. Rigid, stiff, inflexible, fixed, inelastic, stark, transfixed, unflexible. But these are all words that really don't fit into a title very well. <laughs> so the direct translation of it doesn't really work. <clears throat> inflexible of fog. <laughs> That would certainly be a, a contrast, but I don't think it sounds very great. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Unyielding fork. Uh, that doesn't sound very good either. Um, so that does push me into more uh, in a more interesting direction. Like, uh, what if the fog is actually more of a, a problem for, like, if it's an actual sort of threat to the uh, villagers? Like, during fog times, bad things can happen, or monsters come out, or something like that. Hmm. That could be an interesting mechanic. Then you could also have, like, different weather conditions uh, on certain days where uh, more or less fog happens and then you have to fight more or fewer monsters or something like that to get around the place. Yeah. Let's see. <coughs> I hate to be coughing on microphone, but it's almost unavoidable. Well, just don't die. I'm sure I won't. I still have a conference to go to, you know. <laughs> hmm. Unrelenting fog. Unrelenting mist. That sounds kind of okay. Or unwavering. What are you thinking about? I'm trying to see if there could be something that we uh, could involve that thing you mentioned, like how the mist brings monsters. Right. Like if there's some way to hint that with the name. 
Yeah, so what I'm trying to think of with uh, unrelenting or unwavering is sort of uh, these words have a negative connotation, like they imp imply that the, f that the thing is sort of oppressive. So uh, from that, I'm trying to sort of hint at that kind of feature. But uh, I don't want it want to make it like too obvious either since it shouldn't be a primary focus. So something like if you say uh I should uh relentless mist or something like that, that would be too uh harsh, I guess. But yeah. Browsing this these auras is always a good way to find new words and stuff. <laughs> Luckily for us, the internet exists to make that easy. I can't mm -hmm. imagine browsing the uh, these ours in fucking book form. It would take so long. <laughs> well, endless could work, but it's not quite right. Mm. Endless fog, uh, or endless mist. Uh, I'm not sure, because then it sort of, well, hmm, it might work, because then it um, gives a sort of explanation as to why you cannot go beyond the limited game area. So, like, because everything outside is just a gigantic fog, or a uh, mist sea, I guess. Yeah. Hmm. I'm also going to, uh, not right now, but at some point, check out ways to make good looking fog effects in OpenGL and stuff. But, uh, yeah, that's for later. There's more pressing engine issues to go to first. Eternal would be another thing instead of endless. Yeah, that's good work. Eternal fog. But now, is it internal fog or eternal mist? Well, either work. Yeah, but what sounds better? Um, fog or mist? Any, actually, is there any kind of meaningful difference between the two? Oh, interesting. Okay. Here it says, Mist, a cloud of tiny water droplets suspended in the atmosphere near uh, at or near the Earth's surface that limits visibility to a lesser extent than fog, strictly with uh, visibility remaining above one kilo kilometer. kilometer. <clears throat> and fog is below a kilometer. So we would, I mean, just going purely by definition, we would have to go with fog. <laughs> Well, it's not. It's just a name. That's true. Yeah, I'm just. I was just wondering if there is actually a difference, and there is. That's nice. Ah, <sighs> this is still tough. I mean, I suppose if we decide to change our minds, we can always go back on it later. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And having just a project name is an actually bad idea. Yeah, yeah, that's why I wanted to do this first, so we can actually like make a repository. 
<laughs> and stash her stuff somewhere. So would Endless Mist be fine with you or something like that? Yeah, it does sound fine. What do we have? Uh, no, we didn't. So have... it does sound also a little JRPG. That's true, but I mean, it's heavily inspired by these kind of games. I mean, Rune true. Factory and Harvest Moon are both Japanese games. Uh, Unending Mist is what we had. Right. Are you fine with that? Yep. Okay, then I'll plug it in. Alright. Um, aside from that... I had some... Did you make any sort of progress on anything? No, not yet. I've been working too much. That's a shame. I've been continuing on uh, refactoring stuff and putting things together in their proper place. But uh, it's... Still a challenge. All right. There we go. So, in specific, what I wanted to uh, talk about regarding uh, wait, what's going on? Oops, I created it wrong place. Yep. What I wanted to talk about with uh, the uh, game engine trial at the moment is these kinds of uh, changes I wanted to make in the near future. And most of all, uh, what I had to, what it was uh, like hinting at was that I want to sort of find a way to split off uh, the entire window state from uh, the rendering stuff. Because at the moment it's all fixed on uh, a single main window that you can only instantiate once. And then everything else uh, goes back to that. And a bunch of places refer to the uh, main window instance directly. Because uh, they need to get at some information most of the time, like width and height. And uh, other minor stuff like getting uh, the context in some cases. So what I instead, what the problem is with that is like if you if we want to ever have a sort of an editor that's actually useful for anything, we're going to want to have multiple uh, OpenGL windows, so we need multiple OpenGL contexts to manage that kind of stuff. And so I wanted to see if there's a way to split that all off so that you can create multiple kind of OpenGL windows and uh, manage assets and uh, subjects and entities and stuff separately for uh, each of them. Because in that way, what I do want to do at some point is make a graphical editor for Flare's animation system so that you can like uh, make new animations in our editor directly rather than having to like render sprites as we did it until now. That would will give us a lot more flexibility and extensibility for later and it would allow us to like only assemble a sprite sheet for uh, each character model instead of having to do the animation rendering in a different program and then upload that every time it would give us a lot of advantage advantages um yeah I guess that would make sense, at least.
So I'm not entirely sure how to actually do it right now. <laughs> Me neither. No. I'm just saying I want to do it. I'm gonna have to think about uh, the exact some, uh, ways in which to accomplish this feat in uh, the coming few days. Other than that, there's still a bunch of fix me stuffs around there, especially concerning the asset system. Because right now, what you have to do is like you have to know how to handle and access uh, the uh, data field of an asset, and that means duplicating functionality all over the place and potentially writing unsafe code. They want to have uh, some way to abstract it away to give a sort of uh, a way to extend access and generalize it. So, for example, if you have a, a texture asset, you can just call certain uh, a macro like uh, with texture bound or something like that, and then just have it work instead of having to do it yourself. What else okay. do we have for fix me stuff? Um, let me just find that. Lots of things. All right, and then we also need a system to keep track of which buttons and stuff is currently being pressed. Like right now, we only have an event system to react when the state changes, but we don't have anything to, for example, test if the left button is currently being hold, uh, held in a tick. Yeah, I, I was actually thinking on that. I thought I would make some sort of system that uh, updates on the based on the events. Yeah, the problem is like uh, we have we have a, a layer of indirection for uh, for actions. So like we have direct input events for uh, if you press a specific key or press a specific button or turn the axis a certain way. Then an, an event specific to that gets fired, but uh, if you're writing a game, you really don't want to catch that because you want to allow the user to rebind keys and stuff to their preference. So we can't really just do it at that kind of level. We have to take into account actions as well. So we need some kind of general uh, system that records the time between a start and an end event, I suppose, of a certain type. So that it automatically handles when it uh, when an start event uh, comes in, and then it saves that this kind of event is currently being active. But, <coughs> but I'm not entirely sure how to uh, facilitate that yet. Uh, okay, I was... Well, I was thinking right now was like uh, some sort of a map yeah, right. So the problem is, like, if you take a look at the uh, mapping.list file, we have a bunch of actions in here. For example, start left and start right and stop left and stop right and so forth. But then yeah. the problem becomes, uh, what do we call the event? Uh, or what do we call the uh, the saved value? Like... For a, a key, you have a press and a release event, right? So if you were to store that currently the X key is being pressed, you'd store X in a table. And yeah. for this, you don't really know what to store. So you have start left and, and uh, stop left. But what's the name that you want to store? <laughs> I suppose it would be left, but it could be anything. So the system can't really figure this out on its own. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. It is difficult. But that's fun. Yeah. Designing <laughs> stuff is fun. Once we figure it out, at least. Uh, the figuring out part is what makes it interesting to me. Well, yeah, that's... <laughs> I My favorite part is like when we finally figure it out. Like the feeling of success. Ah, right. Uh, 
Yeah, and then the map loading is still a huge problem we have. And of course, another thing is configuration of stuff. Like if you if you load a texture, you need to know how much mip mapping you want, uh, whether you want mip mapping or not, and then what kind of interpolation you want, what the uh, anisotropic filtering amount should be, and so forth. So we need to have some kind of way to store that information almost globally. I'm assuming you want to be able to modify that per OpenGL context you have. So again, we come back to the same kind of problem I talked about before, where the system needs to be able to distinguish all its features that it needs to get from the uh, context and per window, rather than relying on uh, the single top level, I guess, main instance. So yeah, that's some stuff to think about. <coughs> and we still have to pretty much remake the how things are drawn in the pipeline because we need the nested objects as well. What? The nested objects. Oh, that's actually already solved. I thought oh. I told you about that. I uh, oh right, you did. I forgot. Did you read the uh, scene classes document at any point? Like you said you would, or did you forget about that again? I'm pretty sure I read it, but I think I was way too tired to actually comprehend it. Okay. But at least I remember opening it. All right. <coughs> Basically, what you do is just have container as a super class. But I'm not sure if that's perfectly reasonable yet, because uh, the container class specifies a way in which uh, sub objects are like uh, stored, which is an index set. And that might not always be what you want. So we might need a, a different kind of super class that only defines a protocol for iterating over objects rather than a specific um, way of storing them. Maybe you need something more efficient than the index set stuff that I have, because the index set is actually a hash table combined with a doubly linked list. It has efficient removal and adding of elements, but it doesn't have like compact storage or really like uh, really fast traversal because it's not in an array. So there might be some stuff that can be done with that if need it be, but at the moment I don't think that's a bottleneck. Yeah, I don't think we have to worry about that just yet. I Maybe am... once this thing is huge and we have to start optimizing. Yeah. I'm a bit miffed because apparently trying to up uh, the frame rate, frame rate to 60 already makes it lag behind, oh. so I'm not sure. Uh, we should have enough slack for now to work with, but at some point we're definitely going to have to go in and optimize stuff. But uh, that's not for a long time. I'm more uh, bothered by like fucking OpenGL limits that I can't compile the Skybox shader on my crappy ass laptop that's only a year old. <laughs> I don't know what's up with that. Uh, it should work fine with something like that at least. Yeah, it should, but it doesn't. For some reason, a Mesa only has OpenGL version 3.0 for that, and you need 3.1 plus. Oh. I don't know why, but there it is. <laughs> so yeah, fun. I'm trying to find out about the, the CL monitors error I faced it the other day, but this backtrace is kind of... I don't see where it actually happens. Remember to press V on a frame to jump to where uh, the definition is and where the error occurs, if it knows about yeah. it. Yeah.
I only tested it in a VM, so I might have caught, like, forgotten about some kind of problem that might happen in a real uh, machine. But, uh, it shouldn't. I don't know. I'm just not sure what I should be looking for. <coughs> Horrible cough. Oh yeah, on a more happier note, the Ovaltine arrived. Oh, cool. Nice. There's a whole lot of it. It's going to last me like two years at least. Oh, uh, well, you're gonna drink a l whole lot of it if it lasts you two, only two years. It should last you longer. I've had yeah. like a kilogram pack myself and I've had that for more than a year now, I'm pretty sure. Okay, yeah, it's going to last longer. Just make sure to buy enough milk. Uh, I always have milk. That's good. Okay, did you have any other kind of thoughts or questions about stuff? I know I did a lot of things that you probably didn't keep up with. I probably would have if I had had the time to actually work on it more. Okay. Started working on the uh, on a launcher dialog that lets you choose uh, duty resolution, filtering, and vsync and all that kind of stuff. But I haven't worked it into uh, the main system yet because uh, I want like in, this is another reason why I want to have the window separation. Because in order to fit, figure out how much, like what the maximum anisotropy level is and how much anti aliasing you can do, you need to create an OpenGL context. So I want to be able to uh, do that separately from the main window so that you can like boot a minimal thing that only has a context so you can inspect it. And then destroy that again and then launch the uh, main window with uh, all the parameters given that you need. We're also going to need like some kind of in-game uh, UI system at some point so that we can put in buttons and menu elements and all that kind of crap. So that's going to be fun. Oh boy. Yeah. A lot of things to do from scratch. Yeah. So much to do. What was that fucking song called? Smash Mouth, wasn't it? Fucking. God damn it. I can't remember. Goddamn Shrek song. <laughs> okay. <coughs> uh, right, so what was I? Right. I'm trying to think if I had other, any other sort of thoughts. I was pretty sure that I had other things to talk about still. Right. <sighs> We should start writing things down, just like thoughts on a paper. I do write them down if I think they're more uh, important enough. I'm using the issue system for that. Uh, for yeah, the most mean, part. I mean like on Excel notepad. Oh, okay. Well, that's usually not my kind of deal. But uh, if you want to do that, sure, go ahead. I usually write everything on a paper <laughs> on my notes. I only do that if I have a, a specific design pr 
problem and you need to uh, brainstorm about it. But otherwise I prefer digital stuff because I don't lose it that way. Yeah, like at work, right on my table I had this thick long, well, quite a big uh, notepad. That's just the right notes on it. Everything. Alright, that was another thing. Uh, like, how do we control what the current camera is? If you have multiple cameras, cameras in a scene, uh, how do we specify which one is currently active? That was a problem I was thinking about. And also in relation to, like, if you have a first-person camera, how does it actually... Like, does uh, the player object implement the camera itself? Like, does it extend the camera? Or uh, how does that exactly keep synchronized? Because you need to know about the uh, camera data, like the rotation angles, in order to properly determine how to strafe, how to update your uh, location when you move. So I guess actually, in in a, if you make a first person thing, then the player object really should be the camera at the same time, so that the camera can update the location directly. So I guess that's the way to go. I'll implement that. I already added the a uh, first person pivoting camera thing, so that you can look around with the mouse. Oh, okay. So. The player object is actually also a camera. Yeah, so you just right uh, have like define subject player, and then in the uh, superclass list you have the uh, FPS camera for that. Yeah, yeah, okay. That seems to make the most sense to me. Uh, what else was there? Right, I wanted to have a camera for the editor mode. Where uh, moving around forces you to, like, you need to press certain modifier keys to move around, like Alt or middle click to uh, move the camera, strafe the camera, sort of, and otherwise, uh, like, control to pivot it, rotate it, and uh, otherwise, you can just click on things. That way we can... I was thinking mostly of implementing a kind of system that you have in most standard uh, 3D editors like Blender and 3ds Max. So that you can click on objects and then sort of pull on handles to move them around, around and rotate them and all that kind of crap. But first I need a, a camera that's actually convenient to move around with. I was also thinking of one thing that would definitely be useful for that is if you have a sort of an active object that you currently have selected, it would be really useful if you could rotate the camera around that object rather than uh, rotate the camera around its own angle, because then you can much more easily find different kinds of uh, ways of looking at that object, which was a major problem when I actually did some oh. modeling for Luden there. So, an orbit camera. Yeah, but it shouldn't be a separate camera, it should be a mode you can invoke. So, for example, ah, if, you, yeah. if you press Ctrl and Shift, then you rotate around the currently selected object rather than around your own axis. But I wasn't really sure how to uh, calculate the uh, position and rotation to do that, because I suck at trigonometry. <laughs> I'm really, really bad at trick, trick. I have the biggest problems figuring that kind of geometry stuff out. I'm not sure why. <laughs> well, you mostly want to calculate things like that with matrices anyway, since it's faster. Sure, I guess, but then I still don't know how to do it. It just really doesn't work very well in my head for some reason. <laughs> but uh, if you're yeah. fine with that, then go for it. <laughs> I done it before but I keep forgetting how it works like getting my brain actually to think it right but uh, it's a self-contained task so if you want to tackle that then you're more than welcome to yeah, but sure. before we can do that actually that's why I 
uh, came up with the fix me for storing current uh, event stuff because you need to know whether the uh, shift key is being held while you're like moving the mouse around and stuff otherwise you can't even begin to implement this sort of camera true so yeah uh, stuff but otherwise I'm like on the uh, grand scheme of things I'm actually pretty happy with uh, the system we have so far it seems pretty sound I'm not like hitting any sort of deep problems when I work with it which is usually a sign of not terrible design. <laughs> I'm fine with that. The context crap was a problem for a long time, but uh, that should be mostly settled for now. Alright. So... I think uh, for the next step, what I'm gonna do is uh, solve the uh, event retention issue so that you can test against certain events since that seems like an easier problem and then maybe next tackle uh, the uh, separate kinds of contexts and window stuff see what I can do about that I'm not sure if I'm gonna finish it before uh, ELS but we'll see ELS is next week by the way exciting well, I hope you will be posting things from there, because I can't afford to go. Yeah. I'll probably tweet a bit, but not much, since I'll be mostly busy actually listening to talks and talking to other people. But I'll definitely write another lengthy roundup uh, blog article once I'm back. Just like last time. Yeah, it would be helpful. Did you have any uh, sort of thoughts on any other game aspects? Even just like ideas on what you want to ideally do maybe at some point? Well, I've always been wanting to make a combat system. Already, what kind of combat system? Well, something closer to what uh, fighting games would have. That's kind of bizarre, actually. Because I'm not sure how you could... Hmm. I guess that's possible. Well, I count fighting games things like... Well, 3D stuff as well, not just those... Uh, 2D things that are... On a single field. Yeah, I was... Uh... But then, wouldn't it be more something like in the sense of hack and slash, maybe, to make it more fluent? Yeah. Because, uh, as I mentioned a bunch of times before, like, one of the, uh, very nice aspects of Rune Factory ver versus a lot of other, uh, games is that it's very fast and quick. So retaining that would be nice. I don't mind if it would be more complex. Well, you can make it like simple things and complex things both. Like, it, like on Room Factory, you can pick a weapon. Like, but on Room Factory, all the weapons are almost the same. Yeah. <laughs> Their range just changes a bit. Yeah, and they change a bit on how quick you can attack and stuff. But yeah, beyond yes. that, you really don't have any kind of tactic or combos or anything like that. So it would be nice if we could 
extend that and make it more intriguing in itself rather than just smash X. <laughs> yeah, but you could still have a weapon that is just smash X. I guess, I yeah. <laughs> Anything else or something more specific than just uh, a more interesting battle system? Well, related to it, we'll have to figure out some how to control sexually work. Like, how do I explain what I was thinking? Uh, like, you have to be able to. And this is a string of controls, and like some kind of a stack that you can check what's the previous thing and how it affects the next. Oh, you mean for combos and stuff? Uh, not quite, but almost, yeah. What do you mean, not quite then? <laughs> well, let's take a fighting game example because they're not really common there. You, like how you press. Down, down, forward, and forward, and then press a key to make something special. Yeah, that's what I mean by combo. Oh, okay. Um, right. The more pressing problem I'm seeing right now is that we have a much more limited amount of buttons we can use because since we are mixing a lot of, and that's actually probably why Rune Factory has such a simplistic combat system. Since we're using a lot of buttons for other things, like you need to have a button to actually just uh, pick things up, put them down again, and switching items or something like that. So you don't have too many buttons left for just combat mode. Otherwise, things get confusing. Well, unless the key mapping like, changes depending on the mode. Uh, that sounds really awful. Yeah. It might be best to keep it simple, like... Like, you can make a very interesting combat system with just one or two attack buttons. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we can get at least... Well, I'm not sure. What kind of actions do we actually need? Like, we certainly need... Like, if you're close to an item, you need a button to be able to pick it up and then the same button to put it down again. And then you need a button to use the current item you have equipped. Right. Is there anything else? Not really. Well, if... <sighs> hmm. What happens if you... If you stand in front of an object that's intractable? Should you be able to interact with the object if you already have something picked up, or do we want to reuse the uh, pick up button to interact with that as well? I was thinking the other button that actually uses item, but you have to have an empty hand. Ah, uh, no, that sounds very really bad because then you need to constantly unequip your weapon or your tool that you have to. Ah, yeah, yeah, true. Picking up actually works better than. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I guess, right. And then you need a, a button to quickly stash items away in your backpack or your inventory. That's a very common operation. Like, if you pick something up, you need to be able to get it away in a single button press. So we have two buttons that are constantly reserved to uh, item management, I guess, or uh, interaction. And then you have two main buttons left uh, to handle combat unless you want to pull in the triggers but uh, I'm not sure that's a good idea well this is the kind of thing that makes me just experimenting yeah definitely I'm just trying to think ahead and sort of explore if it's like feasible to begin with 
I would say like triggers are useful to open the inventory or uh, do like sort of rotation. No, not rotation. That would be stupid. But I'm just trying to sort of imagine in my head what be what would uh sort of uh, a feasible system to look like to see what kind of constraints we're working with. But I think it should be possible. I mean, we should at very least have at least two buttons available for uh, just combat if you have a weapon equipped. Yeah. And then you can do stuff with having, like, what kind of directions you're pointing in or whether you're pressing it down for a longer time or something like that. And if everyone was using a PlayStation or four controller then you could even do stuff with how hard you press but unfortunately we don't have that luxury <laughs> oh boy that's right another thing that we need to do is like be able to invert the axis of a controller because apparently there's differences uh, that we noticed last time where the Xbox controller has up and down reversed in the axis uh, yeah <laughs> that's true <laughs> Oh boy. I'm mean, still not sure how to implement that in the uh, mapping system. Ne uh, no, it needs to be in the input system that, so that it's normalized. Oh boy. Anything else you were thinking about? Oh, no, it's just a moment. What about yesterday, or the day before yesterday, or anything but not at the moment? <laughs> well, at one point I was thinking of multi multiplayer, and then I thought, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Multiplayer I don't think is feasible, especially with like the sort of more advanced kind of AI that we would need to have for the villagers. Except if you maybe have multiplayer where you don't have any villagers at all. That would work, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, definitely if you have AI, then no way you're going to do multiplayer. And the online stuff is always fun. Fun in heavy quotes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the engine should definitely be able to support that kind of thing, but I really don't want to think about it right now. Yeah. Maybe... Oh, never mind. I almost have to think about it. <laughs> I mean, you would probably just event uh, extend the event system so they have like network events that you can send out. And then you have a, a networking component that captures those events and sends them to the server, which in relays them further. Yeah. Print, uh, in principle, it's easy, but in practice, no thanks. <laughs> then, how about crafting? Oh, yeah. Well, for crafting, I think the most important aspect is the UI of it. So it doesn't get cumbersome. Uh, Rune Factory's UI is actually often kind of unnecessarily annoying. Like how you have to have separate, entirely separate categories for like, uh, whether you're making a shield or whether you're making pants or whether you're making a sword or uh, a farming tool or for baking, you have all the different kinds of kitchen utensils, and that can kind of a pain in the dick because you always need to remember which thing you were supposed to be going to. Especially for cooking, if you don't really know the recipe, you need to check all of them to find it again. <laughs> mm hmm. So. So we would need it, some kind of system that lets you easily filter and sort stuff. Yeah, and actually know what you can do. Right. Otherwise, I think uh, the thing Rune Factory does with the skill is actually fine. 
Uh, hold on. Okay, I'm back. Uh, what was I talking about? Like, right, uh, the system in Rune Factory I think is actually fine. Where you can, uh, you always sort of uh, consume energy to craft stuff. And it takes more, like it takes an extra high amount if it's beyond the current level you are at. But you can still sort of do it if you have enough uh, of it. And other than that, I'm not really sure what really can constitutes a, a crafting system. Is there any much else? I guess we could consider something like Minecraft system where you have to know the exact placement of the items, but that just sounds like a pain in the dick. Yeah, and with Minecraft you always have Wikipedia, I mean, not Wikipedia, a wiki open. Yeah. Or you have a system that does it for you. Like most yeah, people just exactly. use a mod that fucking saves it. It's so stupid. So yeah, we don't we definitely don't want ordering. <laughs> but yeah, mostly something like Rune Factory does is fine as long as we eliminate the fucking dumb need for so many different kinds of categories. Like it would be fine to have separate uh places to make weapons or food. And think they like make medicine or something like that, but yeah, more than that, it shouldn't be split up and should be more of a more intuitive and easier to navigate UI than that. I think a more uh, problematic aspect is actually how to even find recipes to begin with. Like, how does the player uh, know about recipes? Any ideas about that? Not all. Uh, I kind of hate buying that bread from that cook all the time. Yeah, it's very annoying, especially because it's limited every day. Randomly. <laughs> uh -huh. But I also think like something that's completely like where you have to figure it out on your own is very dumb. <laughs> so there needs to be a way to more easily learn recipes. Or more... I'm not sure actually. I guess we could make it... Uh, it's difficult because if you think about stuff like having recipes as a random drop from enemies then you get into the uh, territory where you need to start grinding stuff. And I really, really want to avoid grinding. <laughs> if at all possible. So... But you cannot just really give out recipes freehand either. That would remove a lot of driving, driving force from the game, I guess. So I'm not sure what kind of system we could uh implement to stall how many recipes you can get without making it frustrating uh, maybe some kind of a uh, discover mode what do you mean well so some kind of a we have some almost a mini game or a way to spend stuff you have found to discover recipes hmm but wouldn't that get too tiresome? Yeah, I guess. The, like, the problem with mini games is always uh, if it's too central enough an aspect, it's gonna be really annoying because you have to do it over and over and over again. And because it's a mini game, it's not, it doesn't have much variety, so it doesn't stay fresh for very long. <sighs> I guess what you could do is how about this when you advance your skill level 
for say cooking you automatically learn all the items that are below your current level but if you want to have items that are above your current level you need to go actually buy recipes or find them by talking to people that will give it to you or something like that so you can sort of uh, have two s completely separate ways of getting new rep recipes. You can either cook a lot more and find out recipes by advancing your skill level, or you can go and like try to find recipes in specific from uh, the world around you, I guess. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> Um, well, it could work. What do you mean it could work? No more thoughts on it than that. Well, I'm sorry, I'm just not able to think very well today. I, I'm still trying to follow what Julian said. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry. Okay, so I'll just try to say it again. Um, so. Uh, you have a skill for, say, cooking, and each item that you can cook, each recipe that you can make, has a certain skill level required, I guess, so that uh, so that you can make it. And if you cook more, you advance your skill level, of course. And you automatically get all the recipes that have a required skill level that is lower than your current skill level. Right. So you never have to search for recipes that are below your current skill level. But if you want to have something that's above your current skill level, you can try to get it by buying recipes from some place or something like that. Hmm. Well, there has to be something to actually show progress with, except that recipes just suddenly appearing. So, yeah. What do you mean? Well, magically, just no things. It's a bit weird. I guess so, but I mean, you could argue that you learn it by, like, just experimentation by learning how to handle cooking items and stuff and getting a feeling for what works. I mean... Yeah. I don't know. But it would, like, one of the most annoying aspects of systems like in Rune Factory is that you, a lot of the time you spend a, uh, like getting recipes that are below your current skill level and are really not what you want. Because you want to make something more advanced? Well, maybe you could make it so that there's a list of recipes that somewhere, like, say, the restaurant, that you can learn from there, but they are locked un until your skill level is high enough. Mm. So you can see what you can learn in the future, but, you know, so on. And it would be easy to just pick from there. Spend some time learning it, so so to speak. Hmm. But the problem is that doesn't really make sense. Like, why wouldn't you be able to see it? Like, how does the book know what your skill level is? Um. It doesn't have to be a book. It would be like some person, the chef. Uh, I guess, but that still doesn't mm, doesn't sit right with me. Let me see. Um. Like. Maybe you unlock them by making the final dish that you currently actually know and give it to the chef and then they teach you new stuff. I guess that would work. Uh, hmm. Hmm. What am I thinking of? Uh, let's see. I mean, the other variant is just to say that you immediately know all the recipes, but you cannot make anything that's above your skill level. But that kind of bothers me a lot. 
because then you get into the other side of grinding where you need to just make loads and loads of garbage items that you don't need to just up your level, which is not fun. Well, you could just have to make them all once. Hmm. That's not too bad. <clears throat> well, and if we want to make it more uh, more fun, then we could have like different parts of cooking, like oven cooking and whatever else, frying pan. They all have their own skill levels, but all of them rise a bit from cooking to other things as well. I guess so, but that still doesn't really get rid of the problem per se, because you're still like fighting against the limit instead of just like suffering a penalty from it. I much prefer that, like uh, how you have it in Rune Factory where you can cook basically, theoretically, even an item that's a hundred levels above you, if you can somehow accumulate enough, uh, like, what's its RP. Because, yeah. because then you can theoretically, like, we could say you can uh, buy a really expensive item that ups your RP a massive amount for a very short time, and then you can go and cook that thing, even though it's way above your limit. And that sounds nice to me because like if you if you have a certain like imagine you have a certain villager and he requests say I want that thing but you can't really make it ordinarily because you're not advanced enough in cooking then you could still get it done instead of having to wait for fucking years to get your skill up high enough <laughs> uh, yeah that would actually be quite nice so you can do everything but it just gets easier as you get better Right, exactly. So, but you shouldn't be able to, uh, I don't know, maybe we should just make like big cooking tomes or books that you can buy at the shop for quite a sum of money and they just give you like 50 recipes at once or something like that so that you uh -huh. don't have too little of it and you don't need to get them one by one. Yeah, that's good work. But uh, yeah, the thing with learning from the uh, cook is actually another interesting thing where you could go and sort of train your skills with people in exchange for money instead of having to grind it yourself. So you can hire people to teach you and like sort of... Uh, instantly stat boost your stuff in exchange for money. Pretty sure a bunch of system uh, games actually do that too. That would be nice. <clears throat> what else? What else? Hmm. Um, yeah, otherwise I don't really think, do you have anything else you were going to talk about or think about? Well, there's also the other side of crafting, like, not just making items, but actually building places. Oh, right, yeah, building stuff, definitely. Uh, I'm not sure how to handle that yet. I haven't really thought much about it, especially because of the whole situation with figuring out uh, the problem be between dynamic and static maps in the uh, engine. I've kind of tried to push that into the back of my head. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, we definitely... <sighs> hmm. I mean, one thing you definitely would want to do is, like, be able to put down fields in certain places, like, so you can actually grow stuff at different places. So we could have, like, uh, a sort of, uh, how should I put it, a difference in soil quality or minerals in the ground across the area so that certain plants grow in different places. 
so that he would want to create new fields elsewhere. But I'm not sure to which point you should be able to customize uh, the game world in game itself. Mm. It would be nice though. It would be nice, but I mean, to a point, I'm trying to figure out like beyond minor stuff like making fences or walk paths or something like that. What's the point of it? Because if you get to like bigger things like buildings, there's two questions. One question is how do you even decide on what the building looks like? Because you won't have like making a tool that allows you to make buildings to any kind of degree of configurability is really difficult and it's really hard to get those to work in a way that's not annoying to the user and on the other hand is how does the game even know what to do with these buildings like if you just put down a house say how does the game know what to do with that house <laughs> hmm. I guess that's true I mean, you would have to like, uh, it, you would have to be able to sort of assign people to a house so that they live in it and that they do stuff with it. But I'm not sure if that. Once you do that, it feels more like your player ca character is actually a god who can decide everything rather than just a normal bozo. <laughs> well, maybe there could be one way to like. Hire some people to build things. Right. Hmm. I don't know. At the moment, I think if we just like limit it to building paths and fences and like decoration kind of stuff, or minor utilities like building a well or something like that, it would be fine. I'm just not sure how to incorporate making structures that would actually influence the behavior of villagers into the game mechanics because it seems to be at the sort of a clash to me almost well perhaps at least could be like your own house that you can build mm. but then you get into the problem of like how do you make this happen because at the moment the idea I have is that houses and stuff are 3D models, static ones. Ah, yeah, yeah, I was, I was still thinking 2D. Oh, no, 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 no. The world is going to be 3D for the most part. <coughs> There's more yeah. uh, stuff like plants and items and players are going to be 2D sprites. Again, for the most part, think Paper Mario. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it would be like one really interesting aspect for much, much later would be if, for example, people can have children and the children have to move out of the house and then make their own sort of house or houses get left by or get destroyed by fire or something like that. And then you have to actively build new houses. But uh, figuring out a system that does this sort of artificially intelligent seems really, really, really tough to me. So I really don't know whether we can even make a guess at, as to what that would look like right now. Because we're just so far, so unbelievably far away from being able to do anything like that. Yeah. That's not really wise to do it, make a decision on it. Well, like stuff like decoratory items, we can certainly do because that doesn't really require much of a logic around it. I do want to have like a system that makes villagers, when they walk around, prefer paths and stuff. And make your own player character move faster if you're on uh, paved roads and stuff. Instead of uh, grass or... Uh, yeah. But uh, that's still much, much simpler than anything else. <coughs> I guess, like, just 
for, for from a perspective of player interaction, you could say that like uh, you can maybe help people build a, a house when they have decided to lay down a foundation somewhere or something like that. I don't know, but uh, we'll have to see. Anything else? <laughs> Uh, I think that's everything I have been thinking about so far. Okay. About the game and of the engine itself. Well, what have you been thinking about the engine then? I can't remember. <laughs> God damn you. Why won't you ever remember? Uh. What do you mean, uh? I'm so tired. Stop being tired all the time. It's hard. I know, but most people manage. I'm not like most people. Uh, but yeah, if we don't have anything else to talk about, I guess we'll end it here for, uh, for now. If you're fine with that. We've talked for yeah. an hour and a half almost, so that's <laughs> a fair amount. Yeah, it was a good talk too. Right, we'll do this again soon, hopefully. I'm not sure if I'm going to have time before uh, ELS, but definitely afterwards. Right, see ya. Ah, thank you. See ya.